to Take Time. I'm your host, Patrick Marlette, and let's talk about the Seiko Sarb 017 Alpinist. This is part two, our in-depth review of the Seiko Alpinist. I'm very excited for this one. There were so many questions and, and just commentary shared in our part one video about this piece that I cannot wait to tackle. And on that note, if you are new to the channel and haven't watched the part one video on this watch, I'll encourage you to do so now. In it, you'll see the consumer packaging as well as the original leather strap. It's, it's not gonna be featured here, guys, sorry. Um, but also a first impression of the timepiece. In those first part videos, you can ask any questions or share in any sort of discussion here on the channel about the watch. And those questions will be brought over into our part two video and discussed. Now, I'm gonna handle this video a little differently than I normally do due to the circumstances surrounding this watch. In case you guys don't know, the Saab 017 has been discontinued. You all likely know at this point if you're watching this video, but if you didn't, it was discontinued. And the topic of discussion in our part one video was why we see these on the secondhand market so often. And what's funny is there are, the amount that was there before has just doubled. There are so many more of these on the secondhand market. The only difference being is the prices have just skyrocketed. So after the announcement that these were being discontinued, along with a few other watches in Seiko's range, everyone went crazy. Like the mania surrounding this watch just blew up. And now it's probably at the height of its value on the market. Like I'm seeing people market these and sell these around 600, 700 on average for a new model, used models going for 500. Some people trying to get an upwards of $1,500 for this watch. <laughs> is it worth it? So the real question now is, is it worth it? Um, and a lot of people are asking that, um, is the value of this watch still worth the asking price. Now I'm hoping to answer that question here on the show today. Is it worth the cost of admission, it being so high now? And I'll do so by first tackling some of the questions I received here on YouTube and also over on Instagram. And by the way, if you ever wanna throw questions at me over on Instagram, please feel free to do so. If you wanna follow the week in the life I spend with the watches I'm reviewing, you can do so by following my handle at Take Time Pat. And you can also hashtag Take time, Pat, if you wanna share pictures of your Seiko Alpinist or any of your watches. But one of the major concerns I received about this timepiece was the green dial and how well, or rather how poorly it pairs with clothing. This is one of the first times I've ever seen the conversation shift to one about style. And it wasn't just one individual. A lot of people were coming at me saying they don't like it because they don't believe green pairs well with any of their apparel, or it was just too hard to match with their clothing. This was the biggest concern I received. So on that note, I'm going to run a mini style guide for you all today on how you can pair your Saab 017 or any green dial watch with a strap and make it work. Now for a lot of folks, combining straps with watches comes down to matching the dial color with the strap. Now that is not the only way to pair a watch head with a new accessory, but to suit that audience, I put this on an olive green strap. But I spiced it up a little bit by taking one of my green straps that had a red line running down the center. Guess what? Red is a complementary color to green, and these two colors work really well together. It actually even matches the north on our compass ring, and I think it looks fantastic in combination with this watch, but this is by no means the only combination you can run. Guess what, gang? Tan, beige, any of these shades of brown are gonna complement that green dial perfectly. And they're also gonna further accentuate the gold tones of those indices. Now, what if you don't wanna go with an earthier tone? What if you wanna go even more radical? Perhaps you don't like nylon straps. Well, I've got an option for you guys too. Well, since this sports a 20 bar water resistance rating, why not throw it on a rubber strap? And while we're at it, why don't we make it orange? Orange goes extremely well with green. As you can tell here, I think this combination looks smashing, but what if you wanna make this watch look a little bit more formal for a night out? Why not throw it on a brown leather strap with hues of red in the color tone? Again, it just further accentuates that green dial. 
and makes this watch look stellar in a dressier occasion. As a matter of fact, the way it is now, I could wear this casually, I could wear this with practically anything. Green, orange, again, looks fantastic. Guys, browns, any form of black or shades of colors, that white to black spectrum, green goes well with so much. It really is just as practical as blue is. I found that comment remarkable because I don't usually concern myself with matching my alpinist with my wardrobe. I generally just put on the watch I feel like wearing and go out. But the more I received that question, the more I looked at the alpinist in relation to what I was wearing, and there was never a circumstance where I thought it looked bad. As a matter of fact, it almost always looked good. So uh, I'm going to say this one is a good note in regards to the green tone of the dial. I think it almost always looks good given any situation. Now, for a lot of people, the concern wasn't necessarily the green of the dial, but the gold indices. Now, a lot of people are in the camp that Seiko should have went with silver hour markings and a silver Seiko logo on this dial instead. And I disagree. I think the green brings out the warm gold tone of the hour markings. I think it complements the dial extremely well. And I'm just a sucker for gilt dials in any situation. But I think they did the right thing here color-wise, arranging the palette of the dial this way. You know, it's just, again, it's just a smashing look for this dial. So I'm going to comment and saying that that's a good note here. I think they did a fantastic job with the pairing of gold and green. Now, another remark was that they should have went with loomed indices instead, loomed markers on the dial instead. I would agree that universally that might have been the most appealing. And when it patinaed to a nice brownish golden tone, uh, it would look really fantastic on this watch. Perhaps when they do the next version of the Alpinist, we'll get loomed hour markers, very doubtful. But I, I definitely agree with that comment. I think that would look really good as well. Wow, this I actually not paired this strap with this watch. I just grabbed it from my collection because I thought it would look good and it looks really good. That, that was my style guide for the Seiko Alpinist. Guys, if you have a green alpinist and you needed help styling it with your wardrobe and or your accessories, well, there you go. A little, little food for thought. Now, one of the other concerns I received about this watch was low light visibility. And the complaint was that the gold markers sort of wash away on the dial face when in dim lighting situations. They just sort of appear black along the dial. So it made reading the hands a little bit more difficult. But complementing this dial, we have Lumabrite surrounding the outside of the dial face itself, illuminating those hours. And I never found reading the time in low light conditions to be a major issue. Um, it was never dim enough to where those markers vanished inside of the dial face, and it worked just fine. Now, one complaint I will agree with, however, is about the 6R15 movement. On all of my Seiko models that have the 6R15 movement, there is always a distinct rattly noise. The movement is very loud. Now, when I reviewed watches in the past that had 6R15 on this channel, um, I didn't comment on it because it was never loud enough to become obnoxious or a real issue, but the 6R15 inside the Saab 017 is a very prevalent rattly sound. Like, can you hear that? When it's on your wrist, you, you can hear it day to day. And it does cheapen the feel of this watch as a whole. It, it's one of the noisier movements I've ever had in a watch. And I will agree with you guys on that. It is definitely a bad note. Um, I find that the 6R15 is loud, in fact, and it's been louder than any of my other Seiko models. Now, is it forgivable? Well, I live in a metropolitan area and it is extremely loud day to day on the streets. So I'm not always picking it up, but in quiet settings, when I find some, it is um, it is a little annoying. So I definitely agree with you guys there. 6R15 here, kind of loud. Another reoccurring comment I received was about the internal compass ring. A lot of folks were saying, it should just be omitted. The original Seiko Alpinist didn't feature a compass. So if we were looking at this from a purist point of view, 
sure, it, it doesn't really need a compass ring. However, what it transitioned into, I believe, is its most iconic form. So having the compass is sort of what makes this watch an Alpinist now. So I would say leave it. But I do have an issue with the secondary crown here. Now, as we're taking in this watch, you'll notice that the internal compass isn't perfectly aligned with 12 o'clock. Um, now, I normally set it so that it is, but one of the issues for a lot of folks is that the secondary crown isn't screw down uh, for two reasons. I think the bigger one is the fact that if you're OCD, no matter what, when you wear this throughout your day, if you're wearing it for a couple of hours, it is, in fact, going to move on you. It's not going to stay rested where you want it. So don't, you know, have the mindset that this is going to stay perfectly at 12 o'clock for the rest of your day. It's going to move if you're OCD and that bothers you. This might not be for you. Um, I give it a pass because who cares? I'm not really looking at the compass ring anyways. The second issue with that secondary crown is, again, the fact it's not screw down. Now, this is more of a mental block for a lot of people, and it's an odd hurdle to leap because the earliest dive watches from Seiko didn't feature screw down crowns, but we trusted them to be reliably water resistant. Uh, not waterproof, but certainly water resistant. Well, this has a 20 bar water resistance rating. It should go down 200 meters. Now, for a lot of folks, because this doesn't feature a secondary screw down crown, they're concerned about water seepage, that their $1,500 watch might potentially become damaged. I think there's this weird stigma about watches not having screw down crowns and them not living up to their water resistance rating. And with how wobbly this crown can be, how when you wear it, it moves, uh, that internal rotating compass crown. Um, I, I get the concern, but I'm going to trust the manufacturer here. And if you don't, you can have it pressure tested at your local watch repairman. They likely have a rig to make sure that this is in fact water resistant to the degree that it stays on the dial. But I haven't had any issues with this. I, I've been wearing it literally nonstop. It's just been on my wrist in the shower when I sleep with it. Um, it was raining the other day when I was out with it and I was biking with it and literally no issue. I mean, it was smacked with water and trust me, that North Point was not at 12 by the end of my ride and it was totally fine. So I think you're going to be okay um, wearing this in water. You know, don't let the secondary crown not screw in be a concern. So I'll say that's a null point. However, if you're OCD, definitely a bad point on the crown misaligning the internal chapter ring. Now guys, I really like the dial face of this watch. That was something that was complained about, but I just thoroughly disagree with. I think the semi-skeletonized cathedral hands match and pair well with this dial perfectly. You know, uh, every time I heard that comment, I thought, well, what else would, would look better? You know, give this syringe hands, give this stick hands, give it sword hands, broadsword hands. Well, you know, what, what could pair better with this design and nothing really came up that addressed this and made it better. So, you know, just by that alone, I think it it's fantastic the way it is. Now the black dial version of this same watch, um, the Saab 015 has alpha hands, if I'm not mistaken. Um, they're, they're definitely not cathedral hands. I think they look okay, and I think they look good in relation to the dial face of that watch. The dial on that is slightly different. Uh, even with the date window, it's arranged differently. I'll encourage you to check that watch out. But if you compare these two, um, the green one's much nicer. Like, everything about the dial layout. And it, you know, as well as the cream dial version of the same watch. They both look great. You know, so... Cathedral hands, maybe not everyone's favorite choice, but I think it looks great here, and I think the dial does too. Whew. Okay, with all of those questions and concerns out of the way, I'm going to give you guys my official review of the watch, starting with some of the bad notes I found regarding it. And although I love the styling of this case, I absolutely hate the polished bezel on the front of this watch. I don't know if you guys can tell. I don't wear my watches 
you know, that rigorously, aside from biking with my timepieces, except for maybe the vintage ones, um, this polished bezel, as you can tell up here, picks up scratches and dings and marks so easily. I swear, within the first day of use, the bezel here picked up a, a, a hairline scratch right along the top between 12 and 11. And it, it just drove me insane. I'm like, did it come with that? Or did I put that there? Because I, I'd had it, I wore it through the house, and it got scratched. It is just a magnet for scratches, the bezel being as wide as it is on the face of this watch. I really wish that they went with a brushed finish along the total exterior of the top of this and just had the underside of it high polish to contrast the brushed lines of the lugs here. I think it would have stylistically looked a whole lot better and then you wouldn't have had to been concerned about it getting scratched because it's pre-scratched for you and in a nice, you know, fine pattern. You know, Seiko has some of the nicest finishing work um, out there at any price range. Um, I would have loved to have seen a brushed bezel or if there's a third party company creating them, contact me because I would be so happy to switch this bezel out. You know, I, I get a little OCD over minor things like that. So it was an annoyance. Uh, this is not gonna be a bad note for everyone, but it was certainly a bad note for me. It's a scratch magnet. Now, aside from the high polished bezel, that was really the only other major complaint I had about this watch collectively with you guys. You know, the loud six arm movement and that wiggly crown over at the four o'clock position. You know, aside from those things, I really do like this watch. I'm gonna provide you guys with a wrist shot so you can see what the Alpinist looks like on a human wrist. And here is what it will look like for all of your admirers. And when you are going to admire it yourself, it's gonna look a little something like this. It even matches my gaming table. Ah, just look how good this looks in green. So guys, um, the profile of this watch is fantastic. I mean, it wears very similarly to my Grand Seiko. Um, at roughly 38 millimeters across, uh, it's gonna fit any wrist really well. You know, the diameter is perfect, the lug to lug length is perfect. 20 millimeter lug width, by the way, great universal size. I mean, there's just so many pluses to the scaling of this watch and how it wears that, you know, there's no faults, no faults in this regard. Now, in regards to the lingering question of our part one video, why do we always see these on the second hand market? Now, I think for a lot of watch people, watch, serious watch collectors, it suffers from a curse of being almost too perfect. So I, um, I had a Zen 556, uh, the limited edition anthracite dial. Uh, it's sort of this gray purple dial. And I had that watch for a couple of months and I absolutely loved it. As a matter of fact, it was the only watch I wore when I owned that watch. It was just so well proportioned. The best H-Link bracelet I've ever had on a timepiece ever. Extremely accurate, extremely well machined, and really beautiful. Really, absolutely perfect. But as a watch collector, I found myself brooding over the fact that nothing else in my collection got wrist time. And I got a little fed up with having the 556. The fact it was taking up more time than my Grand Seiko and my UFO, some of my favorite watches. So I wound up selling that timepiece. Now I think the Seiko Alpinist suffers from that same condition. So you guys know, when I bought this watch, it was $350. And from a cost value perspective, you were getting a lot of value for just a little bit of money. And that was fantastic offering for a lot of people but it was so affordable and so nice on the wrist, you maybe found yourself not turning to your other watches. And as a serious watch collector, you wanna go through the rest of your rotation. You know, that's part of the fun of collecting. That's one of my theories as to why these are on the secondhand market so much. My other theory is that folks could not find a way to match the green dial with whatever they are wearing. That's probably why they sold it. What makes this watch so iconic is that it boasts so many great features and was affordable. But now, now it's just another overpriced Seiko. And guys, this watch was in production for years. There are a ton of these on the market. There is no reason that it's nearly doubled in price from when I bought it a month ago to where it is now. 
That's absolutely absurd. Do not buy this watch. Don't buy it now, at least. If you want to buy this watch, I would not recommend you pay over $500 for it. Anything over $500 is absolutely absurd. There's no reason. It hasn't changed since when I bought it a month ago till now. Nothing's changed. It is still just the same $350 watch that was really special for a lot of people. Wait for the mania to die down. Wait for the prices to level out. It will hopefully crash around $400 on average for a used one and maybe $500 for a new one. But at the going rate at this moment, I would say hold off. Enjoy the watches you have in your rotation. And when you're ready for it, pick this one up. I mean, how can I not recommend a green dial watch that works so well given any occasion? You know, this is one of those timepieces like my 556 that would make the perfect one watch collection for enthusiast collectors just getting into the hobby or people that want to own something iconic in their collection. It's one of those watches. Agree with me, disagree with me, let me know in the comment section down below. I will be happy to hold that conversation with you. But as of right now, April 2018, maybe not buy this quite yet. At any rate, guys, if you found this video informative or in the least entertaining, feel free to hit that like button. It looks a little something like this guy. If you have friends, forums, or groups that are interested in hearing someone address the concerns of the masses regarding the Seiko Alpinist, maybe share this video with them. Um, I loved reviewing this one for you guys. I love the commentary we shared across platforms here with Instagram and on YouTube. It was so fun discussing this watch because so many people care about it. And I love having those conversations. So feel free to share this video with them if they want to jump in at the end of this conversation as we're done reviewing the Seiko Alpinist. Well, there's actually one more thing about this watch that I want to discuss with you guys, but I will save that for a separate video. I thought to incorporate it here, but this is probably entirely too long for some of you guys who don't like episodic videos, so I'll stop here. Also, if you're new to the channel and this is your first preview of what Take Time has to offer, well, feel free to subscribe if you enjoyed it. I do watch videos twice a week, so if you enjoy content like this, and you enjoy consuming content like this, this is a great way to get it. Also, next to the subscribe button is a bell icon. If you want to see videos come out precisely when they come out, hit that and you'll receive them then. Again, my name is Patrick Marlette and thank you for the time.